Welcome everybody to a new edition of the online cultural majlis. Uh, my name is Sultan Saud Al-Qasmi. I'm coming to you from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. It gives me great pleasure to be hosting uh, our guest today, um, who's joining us from uh, Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, Professor Salwa uh, Maghdadi will be introduced by another great uh, tour, of, uh, tour de force in, uh, in uh, art history, uh, our dear friend, Dr. Nada Shabboud, who is an uh, art historian based at the University of uh, North uh, Texas, uh, an author, scholar, and I think, and most importantly, in this case, uh, a, a dear friend of all of us, and especially of uh, uh, Professor Salwa Maghdadi. Go ahead and thank you, Dr. Nada. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan, for finally convincing Salwa to do this, because I think you know we all appreciate uh, uh, hearing from Salwa. It is an, a, a pleasure and an honor to introduce my dear friend and mentor, Salwa. We go a long way. As we were just reminiscing um, uh, before we opened, uh, uh, we started, is that we met sometime in the last and the late 1980s. I was doing my master's in, um, in you know, starting to do research on, on Arab art and there's nothing, nowhere to find and now she, Salwa reminded me that I heard her speak in Houston and that's how I knew um, about her work and then contacted her. And I'm assuming we cont I contacted you either via phone or a letter. And I think actually I did write you a letter because that's when I also um, found out about um, ICWA, the uh, International Council for Women in the Art. And I was looking for images for the papers I'm writing. And I do believe that I have a letter somewhere from you re returning my letter that I asked for images and you send me actually, you know, negatives or slides or something. I mean, wow, right? I mean, it was an amazing thing at the time that actually Salwa replied to me. So can you imagine how thrilled I was that actually someone replied to me and supplied images? And it was from then that we remained connected we started um, sort of like a meeting in, in Amman, in Darat al um, in Beirut. But and along the way, I was always in awe of Salwa and her energy and the amount of work that she, um, she did the, uh, uh, and continues to do. Um, the you know, knowledge about the artist and where they are. And then when she actually did, you know, um, forces of change. I mean, this is an amazing, remains a seminal um, uh, exhibition and text um, that not only introduced women Arab artists um, to the US, but to the to even to the Arab world. I don't think before this, there was any sort of way of, of knowing who's doing what and where they, they were. And Salwa was able to go find them and get images from them and do this amazing exhibition that I, I actually have several copies of this um, catalog and every, like in my office at the university at home, because, you know, I need it all the time. It needs to be here. And in fact, just a, um, a couple of weeks ago, Salwa, uh, Suhaila, I see Suhaila here as well. We were doing this um, uh, International Women's Day celebration and that came up um, and your name Salwa came up because you were and still are a force when it comes to Arab artists. Talking about, you know, Bea or any of the women artists, you know, we only know them because you introduced them to us. And I have been privileged to be able to work with Selwa. We have co-edited things together. We have organized programs together. We you know, worked and started AMCA together in the first uh, um, uh, conference workshop uh, when we met and when the idea of, of AMCA um, uh, was, was uh, introduced. So, I mean, we have gone a long way. We've done a lot of things together. And I am so happy that, you know, we remain to do things together, but I'm sad that I'm not in um, Dubai because normally around uh, uh, Art Dubai, this is when Salwa and I are hanging out together and doing things together and planning trips together. And now we have to wait until um, we're able to do this again, but I am so glad to be able to see you here and hear now from you, which I think, you know, everyone is waiting to do that, not hear me speak. So, um, you know, thank you for accepting to do this. Thank you for all the amazing work that you continue to do. The center, this is sort of like, you know, the last sort of spot, you know, cherry on top, 
that you just um, um, uh, pushed uh, for and accomplished will be, you know, a, a great sort of uh, a continuation of your legacy. So thank you for doing everything. Thank you for being a great friend and mentor, Salwa. Oh, Nada, I'm humbled and I really thank you so much for all this. It's too much. But along the way, we had a lot of fun too. And uh, we became good friends, which I treasure forever. That for me was a number one. Can you imagine having a friend like Nada? You have so much in common. You have also, you love to do fun stuff together. We're not gonna go over that now, but uh, all together, it's just the perfect uh, colleague to have and to cherish. Thank you, Nada. So thank you, uh, Professor uh, Nada. Thank you, uh, Professor Selwa. May we start now with your permission? So uh, we have a we have a serious issue here that uh, there's so much to talk about when it comes to Professor uh, Selwa Mughdadi that uh, I don't even know if one hour is enough, but we will try to, uh, to go over very briefly highlights of Professor Selwa Maghdadi's uh, life and background. And uh, I'd like to begin with the question here, uh, Selwa. Um, we want to hear about the backstory of uh, uh, Selwa Maghdadi. And I think we'd like to begin with uh, uh, this lady in the picture here. Can you tell us who she is, the lady who's standing over here? Right, that's my mother. Uh, Mrs. Rabiha Dajani, and I, yes, and that would, uh, photo was taken, as it says, in 1948, and my mother at that time uh, was working as a, actually, social uh, welfare officer uh, under the British mandate during the 40s, and she continued to work and volunteer for the Red Cross, was one of the very first, if not the first, Muslim woman to work with the Red Cross during that time. Uh, that's what that picture is, which leads me to say that I was very fortunate to have two exceptional parents. My mother, who uh, just uh, passed away last year in March, and uh, at the age of 104, was not only full of uh, love for life and energy, but she was truly a pioneer at, of her time. So she, as I said, the, one of her first job was that uh, soon after she was widowed, she took this position with uh, as a social welfare officer. And uh, then uh, she started working in the Jerusalem ra radio station in Jerusalem also in the 40s, and she met my father. So uh, started working in education and has a, a long legacy of uh, co contributing to education in Kuwait for almost 40 years. And so she was an educator, a mentor, uh, and an uh, author. She authored two books. Uh, she did, one was a biography of her life, an amazing life between Palestine and Kuwait. And she loved Kuwait, was her home. And, uh, and she, uh, yes, that's, that's it on that one. And I want to say thank uh, uh, Sultan, who wrote a wonderful obituary about my mother, uh, also summarizing uh, her life and her contributions. Thank you, Professor. I think we were all very moved by the dedication that you showed to your mother uh, in the last few years, of course, and uh, we wished, we all wished we could there be there with you. Um, unfortunately, this uh, pandemic had started, and so everything uh, was very challenging at that time. But as I was doing research for the obituary about your mom, I realized that she was a, a person who was um, involved even with uh, receiving high, uh, high, uh, high level delegates in Kuwait. Uh, I think she was, uh, she received the Jamila Buhirid, the, the Algerian freedom fighter. Uh, how does a Palestinian woman go to, another, to, go to Kuwait and end up receiving a freedom fighter officially in the airport, uh, uh, even though that wasn't part of our talk, but uh, I'd like to hear that story if possible. Well, uh, as I said, my mother was quite, uh, I mean, there were many other uh, uh, Kuwaiti women, I'm sure, but maybe more conservative and uh, were, uh, uh, did not wish to go to the airport or do that. So at times my mother was called upon to uh, represent Kuwait and uh, welcome dignitaries. And this was quite often 
as my father at that time, early in the 1950s, was the director of the Department of Education. Now that is like the Ministry of Education uh, for uh, two years before becoming the assistant director. And, uh, and so, yes, I, re I do remember actually Jamila Bahred coming to our home and I, it was a very big event. My father was, uh, uh, was a big, big supporter of the Algerian revolution and the revolutionaries who, so we've had several who had visited us. I can, I remember that. Uh, who, and uh, who were living in exile at that time, many intellectuals among them. So yes, my mother uh, was a pioneer actually, and uh, she took her first position in Kuwait as the principal for Shweikh School, uh, Sharqiya School uh, in uh, Kuwait, and that was an elementary school for girls. Here I am with my parents and my brother, Salim, and this is taken in Ahmadi. Yes, it says that there, yeah. In Ahmadi, in nine, around 19, uh, possibly maybe earlier. So I'm not too sure of the date, but it looks like you can date me now. Uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Salwa, can you tell us about life in Kuwait? Uh, did, did you feel at home when you were in Kuwait? Do you, do you feel, did you feel that you belonged? Of course, absolutely, absolutely I belong. I, uh, the, the, my, first of all, I wanna add that my father was a leading Arab nationalist. So we were brought up, we are Arabs first. And that for me, going to being in Kuwait, I mean, Kuwait was home. Uh, I, uh, I mean, my early childhood was in Kuwait. I still remember the song of the uh, pearl divers as they came in, in from with their dows, you know, across from our home, which was on Sif, uh, that's right by the water. And I remember one day coming home and my mother was very angry. She couldn't find uh, in one of her uh, valuable uh, decorative pieces, which was uh, like a chest, a dowry chest is called. It's a traditional uh, box where uh, the family play, st stores all the uh, 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 items for marriage in preparation for the wedding for their daughters. And my mother had obtained one of those in our living room and my father simply took it to <laughs> include it in the collection of the very first uh, museum that he helped establish in Kuwait. And this was one of my first memories of museums that my dad took taking my our furniture to furnish another house or another building. So I wanted to know what that museum was. So I, from that point on, I accompanied my father on many of his trips because he was trying to convince me he wasn't stealing from my mother. Look what we do with this. We show it to more people. We're gonna move it to the, this wonderful building. So I was with him when he first opened that very first museum. I think it was around that year, 57, 58, around that time when the first museum was established in Kuwait. I also accompanied him uh, and these were very special times to trips uh, to Failaka Island. Uh, he often went by helicopter, but I wasn't allowed to join him then. So he took a special boat to Failaka so I can join him. And that was a, the, one of my very precious memories of my father. He, and that's where I learned, I think, to love and appreciate and honor my culture, my language. And that's uh, one of those, uh, uh, he, he was, my father was not only an intellectual and a historian and educator, he was also, he had, he, he, he had a sense of humor. So we, we was never angry at us, at me uh, in real anger. It was always sit down, let's discuss this. And uh, would you do this if this happened and so forth and so on. So it was, a. Uh, uh, I was quite fortunate to have these two very different in some ways. My mother was vivacious and uh, loved people, loved, and my father was a true intellectual. He wanted to be in his office writing and not to be disturbed. So that's what this picture Professor, is. About. Professor Selwa, uh, there was another incident that I'd like to ask you to maybe share with us. An incident about you learning how to swim. Oh. <laughs> Well, it was in this, actually in the Ahmadi as well, that 
I was younger though, I may have been, I don't know, five. And uh, my father simply uh, uh, held my arms, my hands actually held me by my hands and dropped me in the water. I have never swam before. And uh, all of a sudden my mother was screaming and that was off the jetty. So it was very, very deep. I could see the base of the hull of the ships, uh, the cargo ships on the side. And I, I remember this is an incident I'll never forget in my life. Uh, but it, 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 the water was crystal clear. That's how Kuwait was then. And with tons of fish swimming around me and my father just dived in after me right away. But, but for me, that was quite an experience. <laughs> yes. Professor, um, th this is the school that your mom taught at and the one that you studied at. Actually, my mother was a principal. She never taught. My mother was never a teacher. She, her very first job in education was the principal of this, uh, the Madras de Sharqiyya Lil Banat. Uh, and uh, that was very close to our home. So we could, I could walk to the school and not far from the Sif, you know, the coastline. And uh, yes, and here I am with the rest of the students. And my mother is in the, uh, standing in the back row in the middle. Uh, yes, and then on the right is a, a teacher, and the left, uh, Wakil, a uh, secretary or assistant. Yes, that Professor, was. Where were the students from? The other students we see, I mean, were they mostly from, uh, from the Levant? Were they Arabs? Were they non Arabs? No, they were all Kuwaitis. I think I'm, I'm the only one who was uh, very few. Yeah, they were mostly Kuwaitis. They were, uh, yes, absolutely. And I remember during those years, my mother used to visit many Kuwaiti homes at times to uh, convince the parents to send their daughters to school. It was in, uh, and in that school, my mother experimented on many methods of education. She had an experimental farm, a small vegetable garden, and uh, a few, uh, you know, domestic animals, you know, uh, uh, chicken and roosters and all that. And they were not truly allowed, but she decided that's what she wants to do. And that's how children should learn. So uh, it was fun to be there, but, uh, and here she is then that she took a job of, uh, uh, for a few years, she was the head of the, she was responsible for all the expat teachers in Kuwait. And that was a job I could take, uh, talk an hour about. Uh, it took uh, all uh, her time. And then she moved on to become the inspector at the mini of uh, uh, elementary schools in uh, girls' elementary schools. Uh, and that was in, uh, and you can see here that's when she worked with the Ministry of Education. And on the other photo actually comes from a much earlier period. Uh, and this is with my mother. And that's what she told me. So I, I sometimes question if that is really my mother, but. That's a picture she gave me. And I know that the uh, lady next to her is uh, Mrs. Hindel Husseini, who was a very close friend of my and colleague of my mother uh, at that time. She is the founder of Dar al Tifl al Arabi in Jerusalem. So my mother was surrounded by pioneering women. I mean, among her friends, I can count uh, several Palestinian leading women activists and feminists of, uh, from the 40s and even earlier 30s. And uh, this is one of the more recent photos from the late 90s of your, your uh, mom. But on the right, um, it's, she, she's wearing a traditional Kuwaiti uh, dress. Yes. Absolutely, and, yeah. Uh, you have to do that. Yes. And so I feel like uh, your, your, your parents were very much at ease in Kuwait, that Kuwait offered them a, a space in which they can, uh, they can assimilate and uh, be part of the community. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I remember going with my father to the Emir, to the ruler of Kuwait. Uh, he took me with him. That's when he was asking for a building for the museum. And he had just been working on plans for Thanawiyat uh, al-Shuwaykh. So, and uh, I, I, and it, to me, it seemed like he was asking for himself, but it was to, he, to build the infrastructure of education in Kuwait that was important. So I remember that's another memorable, memorable trip. So 
uh, our house was always, uh, we had always uh, visitors and the circle of intellectuals. My mother loved Arabic poetry and so did my father. So they had these Arab poetry sessions where they competed with the, the you know, uh, this is a very well known among Arabs. Uh, I don't see too many here or see too many people doing that these days. And yes, that's me in, in Suley Bihat in Kuwait in 1960. Absolutely. My, I, I love riding bikes. I, that's one of my favorite uh, sports. And uh, that, that's the only bike they could find for me in Kuwait at that time. They didn't have children's bikes. In Suley Bihat. Tell us about the compound that you lived uh, you, you lived in a compound. Yeah, it was the Suley Bihat compound. All the, uh, that combat was raised, uh, it is not, does not exist anymore. It was mostly for consultants who were hired by government. Uh, and it was originally built by the British. So they would look, the homes looked like barracks almost with red, red uh, roof, brick roofs. Then I moved on to, uh, to a boarding school, uh, actually a German uh, boarding school in Jerusalem, which happens, and you can see the picture is uh, Schmidt Girls College and uh, it's uh, located right outside Damascus Gate in Jerusalem, a beautiful setting. So one of those pictures there is where we would uh, in the morning brush our teeth overlooking the Dome of the Rock. I mean, that's the kind of view we had of uh, the, an open view of the, of the old city of Jerusalem. And that's where I grew up. And I'm here with my very close friend, Micheline Dabdou and uh, the rest of the students when that's how the nuns in those days uh, wore these dress. And so we learned la German as a language and uh, most of the subjects were taught in English. Professor, I have two questions. Uh, first question is how did you end up going to Schmidt's Girls College? Was it a scholarship? Did someone recommend you? And my <laughs> second question is probably more important. How do you always look so photogenic and smiling and so good in all these photos? Oh, 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 no, that's, that's not a question, <laughs> but uh, let's go for the first one. No, it wasn't, there were no scholarships to that school. This is a private school. And actually I went, my, um, my, it was my mother's decision because she was working and didn't have time and they weren't able to find someone to take care of me. Uh, when I was uh, five years old, I was sent to a boarding school at, called the, uh, Friends Girls College uh, School in uh, Ramallah. And that was possible because my sister was there at that time. But uh, then uh, I was very upset and wrote it, had a teacher write a letter to my father that you don't love me, you have all these schools in Kuwait and you send me overseas. I was on the next plane back to Kuwait. And, uh, and then I stayed two years, but situation again, there no one to take care of us. My mother very busy with her work. And so was sent, uh, my father selected the school for me. So it's a private school. It's, it was not a government school. And my mother graduated from that school uh, uh, before me from that very not same uh, location. It was in the, uh, uh, the part of Jerusalem that was usurped in 1948. And my grandmother went to a German vocational co-educational school also at the turn of the century. So uh, it was sort of like a tradition. My father also studied for his PhD in Berlin as well in the 1930s. So his, his studies were interrupted by the war. This is an interior uh, courtyard of the school on the right and on the left, that's me visiting the school in around 2006. I went along with five other classmates, uh, in, uh, including my dear friend, Micheline Dabdou from Bethlehem. And we revisited revisit, the school. It was a wonderful mini reunion sort of, which is rare these days. How could you possibly meet in Jerusalem? That's right. Okay. okay. So I, I just want to point out that we are almost halfway through the talk and we're still in her teenage years. So this is, this is the interesting character that uh, <laughs> Professor Selva Baghdadi is. Uh, yes. Professor Selva, we, we see... In the, hmm? Let's go faster over these. We'll go faster, okay, fine. But uh, we see in the background, is this the house, the one that's behind the car? Yeah, that's the, house the part, right. 
and this is raised now. And do you, when you look back at these days, do, are they good memories? Do you, uh, do you miss these days? Are they days that you remember fondly? I, very fondly. My father was alive then. You know, he passed away when I was 13. And, uh, and Soleil Bichat was a fantastic place to grow up because I had, oh, I could roam around on my bike all over the place. The sea was in front and my father swam all year round. He was very athletic. And uh, so he also walked to work. He was a very unusual man for those days. Imagine walking in the heat or in Kuwait to work from Soleil Bichat to the ministry. And so, yeah, he, the, so I had fantastic, fantastic time. I loved Kuwait. So, so yeah, that's Jerusalem with my friends and that's on a uh, trip right after, uh, unfortunately, after my father died. Then my mother, we, I went with my mom on a trip. So let's move on, maybe. Okay. Could we move on? Tell us about Lebanon. Oh, that's moving. Uh, yes, I was uh, the first two years of my uh, education in college was at uh, what is now Lebanese uh, American University. And this is with my dear friend, Hasna Rida. We were both, uh, you can call uh, active students. And she was uh, a wonderful, wonderful dear friend. I don't know if she, I, I, I didn't send her an invitation, but I thought maybe she'd be here today. If she is, uh, these are one, she actually sent me this photo because I'm here and most of my photos are in the US. So I don't know where uh, Sultan brought in several other photos as well. So but yeah, this is one of the activities we put together. It was an exhibition for Palestinian artists and uh, we had uh, Palestinian uh, national songs as well <laughs> for the exhibition. There was a, like a background of music. This is very unusual, I guess. <laughs> you don't hear that anymore. Okay, let's move on. You provided the sound effects. Here, I would like to point out that Professor Selwa has been active with the Arab art scene since the 1960s as a very young, uh, woman, and uh, we see on the right, if I'm not mistaken, wor works by Jumana Al, -Al Hussaini. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. All th the first three works on the right are by Jumana, with very different style from her uh, more uh, contemporary period of the 90s when she switched to different, uh, completely abstract work. Uh, this was an, um, a, I cannot say I curated, it was organized. I didn't even know the word curation, but for me, it was important to show uh, Palestinian art in Lebanon. And uh, at that, in that year, I was also, and the year actually for two years before that, I, uh, I had met uh, Ismail Sham and Tamam Shamut in Beirut, and I, I, knew, I knew Jumana as well. So I spent a great deal of time with these artists and, um, and other artists. And I, Ismail at that time was uh, uh, collecting archives on artists and uh, information on Palestinian artists. And I helped him. So you can think of me as a student research assistant. For, and I, I just wanted to spend all my time there in, uh, you know, uh, with Ismail and Tamam. I mean, they, they gave me a great introduction. And my first introduction to art was actually by Sophie Halabi because she was a good friend of my parents, lived in Jerusalem. And uh, they would uh, leave me with her when they were busy uh, working in Jerusalem uh, in those days. So I watched her paint, her landscape painting. And from there, I think I saw only one exhibit in Jerusalem at the YWCA, YMCA, I think. And then after that, it was all uh, in Beirut that I got introduced to art and I fell in love with art. And I saw all this wonderful Lebanese art and said, why isn't the Palestinian art on exhibit? So that's what this came up. This and, and this one was uh, actually at the uh, Arab University, I think. Yes, maybe, yeah. Um, this is a special time for you because you are, as you said, you are an active student. You are almost an activist students who were involved with a number of organizations. But here, I'd like to ask you specifically about the General Union of Palestinian Students, because I see here that you are the Secretary General. Is it usual for, for um, women to assume such high leading positions, especially in the 1960s oh. and at oh. your age? 
kind of long story, but in short, I ran, uh, I was a student then at AUB, I ran for the elections for the uh, GAPS, we referred to it at that time for GAPS. And it was a tradition that if any, if, we, if we, women uh, uh, ran for elections, they would always uh, take the position of the secretary. And that year I decided that's not my role. It's not gonna be my role. I was already very active then and I didn't see why it should be assigned to women only. And uh, so uh, I wanted to run as the president for the GAPS branch in Lebanon. And I ran the Fatah list. So they were worried that the list will lose because the Arab students from the Arab university would uh, not vote for me. And that was not the case as, uh, as it showed that I actually gained the highest number of votes among all the lists that ran that year. And that made me quite eligible to be the, the, pre the, the president of the branch. Still, Yasser Arafat did not agree, and uh, he came up with this position, which no, none of the branches had that position. Uh, anyway, and in the end, we came to this kind of uh, agreement, <laughs> and that's how it happened. And, and this, this is your friend from the previous image. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. And mm. We were uh, the, we had a student trip in Faraya. Yes. Okay. Okay, we move on there. I have so many questions, but I couldn't ask uh, now. Well, congratulations on this graduation image. Uh, okay, then we can move on. We can move on, wonderful, great. Okay, here, here we, we, we're, we're back in Kuwait here. Um, this is, I believe, the opening of Sultan uh, Gallery, Sultan Gallery being one of the first commercial galleries in the Gulf region. They opened, I think, with an exhibition of a Kuwaiti artist, Munir Al-Qadi and an Iraqi artist, Ismail Khayyad, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, do you remember going to this exhibition and how did you end up going there? Oh, we, we, knew, uh, we knew the sult uh, sultans from a while back. They were friends of my sister, Sausan here, Lababidi. She's my half-sister, that's why Lababidi. And her husband next to her is Nabil Dajani, he passed away. And, uh, and this is Dijnan El Basho. So uh, I, I was already active, as I said, in uh, familiar with the artist. Uh, and uh, so I've been, uh, since they opened, I, when, if I'm in Kuwait, I always try to attend the exhibitions. And uh, Jinan, as you know, is a Lebanese, well-known Lebanese artist. And she happened to be the, my sister's neighbor. So when I already knew her from Beirut, she, and, uh, my dear friend Afaf Izre also helped me set up some of the exhibitions I had organized in Beirut. Okay, okay. moving on. Um, here we sort of jump about a decade or so. Um, why don't we have images from the 1970s? Why are we here in the 1980s? And what is this exhibition that you were involved with? Well, you have the last one was 1971 from uh, graduating from AUB and then I went to Kuwait brief for a brief period and then moved on to the United States. I, I was uh, planning to study at uh, UC Berkeley and found that this is they didn't have any major in art of this region. It was, uh, you know, in the end, uh, I ended up taking a study, did independent study, took fantastic courses like uh, with TJ Clark and others. And so I was very lucky that I was able to do that because I, uh, well, that's another subject, but let's talk about the art. And yes, why there weren't any art activities? Actually, if from 1975 to about 1985, I, I worked independently, not with, not under a structure of an organization, because uh, I tried to, for example, this event came about because uh, I submitted a, a proposal for the Young Museum in San Francisco for an exhibit of Arab artists, men and women artists, no distinction here. And uh, I, I received a letter say, stating that maybe you wanna uh, contact the ethnographic department across the, uh, from us at the California Academy of Science. I said, what? 
I, this is an art exhibit. Why shouldn't it be with the other artworks? But that was the beginning of, uh, I realized later on, of years of rejection, years of non, you know, uh, marginalizing art from this region and not considering it worthy of being exhibited along with other arts. Well, they, they, well I didn't look at it as an insult at all. I, I felt that they were simply not ready. And to prove that, I went to the uh, to look for to visit the San Francisco Museum of Art, and that it was in a very it was a few it was a small space compared to what I imagine is going to be a huge building coming to the U.S. going to the the MoMA. Uh, then it was actually uh, housed in a, uh, in the west side halls of the, I think, War Memorial Building in the Civic Center. So I went there to see if there had been any exhibit for Arab art. And I found actually uh, documents listing uh, one exhibit by Mehdi Omar in 1950. So I was beyond excited. You can imagine, I mean, I went there wondering what to find. And for me, I couldn't exhibit art anywhere, but 1950, there was an exhibit for Mehdi Omar. So it was, uh, you know, gave me hope. I said, no, no, there is a possibility here. And uh, they're just starting. I could see a small exhibit there. And in 1970, I think they had works by Clifford Still, and they just started to get donations of artwork. So that's way before they moved to their fancy building. So that uh, shows you that Arab art did exist and there was an exhibit then and it was titled Contemporary Art from the Middle East. So I thought that was also very interesting, abstract. Actually, the title of the exhibit was Abstract, art, con abstract Contemporary Art from the Middle East. So that I find very interesting. Still, I met them halfway and organized this uh, exhibition called Costumes and Customs of the Arab World, where I introduced the uh, culture from the Arab world in the, through these kind at the California uh, Academy of Science. And then they liked it so much, they asked me to curate another show, which I did was uh, called the, the History of the Garbanzo Bean. And that was a lot of fun to do uh, in the same ethnographic department of the Academy. And uh, beyond that, I started, I was, uh, you know, uh, noticing that more and more books on nonfiction and nonfiction about the Arab world had these images of exotic veiled women on the cover. So I started writing letters to publishers like uh, Simon and Schuster, Glenko, uh, uh, school, uh, they, they published school, high school books and uh, complaining that this is uh, not uh, yeah, acceptable. And, uh, and we have nothing against women wearing veils, but uh, not in the presentation and the context that they present it with. And it's always the same, always exotic images, whether that or otherwise. And then I managed to convince several of them by sending them, as I did to Neda, slides of artwork to select from. And they ended up, so I had ended up having several books published later on that were published with the images from art by Arab artists. And so that uh, these kinds of uh, projects, I went ahead and uh, whatever I could do individually with, uh, with that didn't cost much because we, I couldn't raise money for uh, another project called the Arab uh, the Arab world in a suitcase. So I bought, a, found somewhere a peddler suitcase like the first Arab Americans, many of them uh, actually were peddlers when they first arrived in the early part of the or mid 19th century. And, uh, and so I found one of those ba similar bag and put a lesson plan in it. So in uh, with the all kinds of activities for children, and then did some programs for high school. Even Jumana Husseini, uh, before uh, before forces of change, way before, in, I think it's in '86, visited. Uh, I invited her and organized the three state exhibit for her in Texas, in Los Angeles, and San Francisco, uh, with her and another one. So, and, and she went with me to high school uh, to present her work. 
and present. So these are the activities I felt, well, they, they can't understand our contemporary art or they don't wanna appreciate it as, uh, and so we let's, okay, that's fine. Let's uh, do it uh, their way. So proposals for uh, works of art. And uh, by that time I had a number of uh, works by, from our images in a large number of images. So I would be writing proposals to museums like in, uh, in New York, I had met, uh, I saw Mona Hatoum's work in 1985 and was like blown away by her uh, performance called Roadworks uh, in Brixton, I remember. It was a, quite a, a, not a safe neighborhood, but it's a very interesting time. Uh, there were riots then at that time, demonstrations, a black woman was shot by the police. I mean, it's almost deja vu considering what's happening now with Black Lives Matter and what happened recently in Belgium. And uh, that work is, 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 uh, was cr crucial for that period of time. And I was so impressed by it. I came back and I said, this, I have to uh, you know, propose work. So I did, uh, submitted several proposals for five artists, men and women artists to New York galleries Nonprofit galleries, uh, one museum, they all said, oh, our, uh, this is not the kind of work we're looking for. Our calendar is full, the usual. So finally, I heard about a museum called the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. that was about to open in 1987. So I said, oh, well, the Americans love to patronize Arab women. Let's see. The, if they would accept a proposal. So I started by first sending, which I've been doing for some time, books on uh, art of the Arab world I shared with the universities and the museums in the past. So I sent them a whole box of uh, uh, books on and catalogs by for Arab women artists. And the president of the museum called me to thank me for the donation. She said, we've never had anyone. We always wanted to... Uh, you know, include art from the Middle East and uh, and we'd never had anyone approach us. So we would, uh, they really appreciate it. I said, I know how you can thank me by uh, reviewing a proposal I already have written for your museum. And she said, okay, let's try that. And that's how this Forces of Change was born. And uh, it brought in the works by 73 artists uh, from, like um, at least mo or most of the Arab world. And the artwork came from 18 countries. And in those, uh, the, the, travel, the exhibit traveled across the US, I think five states at that time. And uh, I have to say that uh, the, only, the one of the reasons it was successful was that I was, uh, the support that was due to the support I received from Professor Laura Nader and Etel Adnan. And here they are with me together with uh, our friend Gra uh, Lola Grace. We established the International Council for Women in the Arts slash Culture and Visual Art Resource. So we didn't really want to limit it only to women, but uh, it just, uh, you know, it was one approach to get into the our foot in the door, so to speak. And uh, I, I was very, very fortunate to have both Etel and uh, Laura as my, uh, and, and Lola as uh, colleagues on this project. Uh, and here is uh, a photo of the artist. And what was important about this exhibit was that at every venue, we had an extensive educational program, film, uh, film uh, series of films. Uh, we had a three-day conference in Washington, D.C., brought in uh, one day dedicated to women in science and technology and one uh, and other such uh, and a, a host of other topics. And then in at, when it moved to Atlanta, we collaborated with Emory University uh, and had a major conference. You'll see pictures of at the uh, Carter Center and we also may, I wanted also the artists to meet their peers, their American peers. So that was also reminiscent sort of, of other projects I've done in the past in the late, in the early eighties where I invited uh, prominent women to the Bay, San Francisco Bay area and arranged for them uh, to do a series of lectures 
uh, some appeared on television actually and uh, met with their peers, with their American peers. So there was a lawyer who met with um, uh, women lawyers, etc. And here you can see images from the forces of changes. My dear friend, the late Huguette Kalam, in front of her uh, beautiful costumes, which I saw. Actually, I met Huguette when I was 17 years old in Beirut, and her work and her personality to totally blew me away. I've never seen anyone with this kind of open personality. I mean, I always thought my mother was exceptional. And then I met uh, it, uh, Huguette and I said, oh, there are other women like my mother who are outspoken and uh, happy and love life and joke, all kinds of jokes. And so here is the uh, photo of the artist. So it was important, like uh, I think Nada said, many of the artists met for the first time. They never heard of each other. And so that was an interesting time. And this is the conference at uh, the Carter Center in Atlanta. Professor yeah. Selwa, um, first of all, I, I want to say that I am in awe of all your work. And I think you are uh, such an exceptional leader and that we are so lucky to have you. And I wish we can multiply you, we can multiply you and clone you and have so many of you all over. Because what you have done, I think the fact that you brought all these giants, these leading artists, I must admit that part of me is a little bit jealous that I wasn't in that room, surrounded by these great uh, artists. And how did it feel to be in a, in a room with Oget and Leila Shawa and Mona Saoudi and, and all these great women artists surrounding you? How, how did you feel a sense of, did you feel that this is a moment, did you feel that this was actually a, a turning point? Was it? Well, I, for me, I was proud of their achievements. I think that, that was important, more so than how it uh, impacted me. What, I, what my goal was from the very beginning to get this artwork to the United States, to be able to exhibit it on par with other artwork from, uh, from around the world. And that was, uh, and, uh, and, and this was amazing to have them there and speak. So each one of these artists spent time with, uh, uh, spoke to other artists or spoke at the local, we have, there were five universities we collaborated with each one, each, and artists spoke at each one of these, uh, Spelman College, Agnes, uh, yeah, and other uh, colleges. And this, then the exhibit moved to Chicago and we had a, uh, uh, sort of a one day seminar at the Art Institute that was very welcoming and it was a wonderful opportunity to meet the faculty there and uh, the, the culture center where the exhibit took place was not very far from there. And I have to say that uh, uh, one of the artists, uh, it, of course, was Wujdan Ali. And Wujdan was a major supporter of this exhibition. She be, really believed in it and uh, helped a great deal with it. And later on, I also got the support for other projects such as the Venice Biennale from Soha Schumann, who I have known for many years and I'm a great admirer of her work and Wujdan's work as well. Professor, uh, there was another major event that took place concurrently, um, which I'm getting to in a second. This was the first time ever, and I hope the slide is coming up, the first time ever that um, you, you were able to put Arab art on the internet. And I'm about to show you a screenshot of a oh. website that shows you Arab art by women on the internet for the first time ever. This is 26 years ago. So I, anyway, I'm just going through images of the, uh, of the oh. forces of change. But can I, you tell us about the story of how you ended up well, I, 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 uh, I live very close, not far from Berkeley, UC University of California, Berkeley campus, and I'm a frequent uh, uh, visitor to their library and all that. So I always checked in the, would sit when the internet, the World Wide Web became a reality. The first thing I did was go there and try Arab art uh, of all configuration, Middle East, you name it. Not the, always the same thing would come up, Arabian horses. 
forces. Where is the Arab art? There, no, there is no Arab art. There's only Arabian forces. And I was like beyond, uh, you know, I couldn't believe it that there could be nothing there. I entered names of artists, the Azawi, uh, Khalid Jubran was there as a poet and artist, but that's it. Uh, so many names I, uh, were non, non men, not mentioned. So I tr we didn't, couldn't raise money at ICWA to uh, upload images on the internet. But then I, uh, uh, Marielle Magenda from the Arizona, Univer uh, Arizona State University was preparing uh, uh, to, uh, uh, she's an artist and a professor of art there and preparing for a Beijing women's conference at that time, uh, an installation. And she wanted to include work by women artists from around the world. And she contacted me and I said, fine, I will uh, help you with the Beijing conference on one condition if you would upload these images for us. And that's how I believe these were the very first images of uh, art uh, on the internet from the Arab world. I, because at that time I checked, there were none that I could find. If somebody knows of any from 94, I would be happy to know where they are uh, about them. So that, and then what was uh, uh, an, a beautiful outcome of this project was uh, the, that we started receiving all these letters. There was no email, remember? And people would get excited. Oh, I went to school with Saad al attar Do you have her contact info? And I mean, we spent time just doing these social reintroductions <laughs> for them. But it was a wonderful time to do that. And one other first, actually, I didn't mention earlier in Forces of Change, is I was the first person to commission Muna Hatoum for work. And that was for the two cha chairs, wire mesh uh, that we exhibited at uh, in uh, Forces of Change. Uh, here is other exhibits there. Uh, I know everybody remembers me only by that one exhibit. There were other smaller exhibits. Uh, Rhythm and Form was one I was very proud of. Unfortunately, we didn't receive funds again for a proper catalog. I worked uh, with Salma Khadra Jayusi. She prepared a wonderful essay for it. We weren't able to publish it. And, uh, but it was a great, uh, then here is one. I also worked with wonderful research assistants. And here is one, Nada Shalabi, Yum Nashlala, Bana Katan all very now very dear friends and very accomplished uh, artists and art professionals. And this is uh, an exhibit uh, that year 2004 was five, 2004, five were very busy time. I, that's the time I did, I was a guest scholar at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and worked on the timeline of art history. And here, uh, uh, is an exhibit I curated that the following year in 2005 for the inaugural exhibit for the Nas National Museum of Arab Americans. Or, uh, uh, and uh, so, and then I moved to Jerusalem. I worked with a project a program for the UNDP uh, to help, uh, they hired me actually as a consultant to help establish the first uh, museum. And then I convinced them that what is really needed is a community center for the arts. And that I, uh, there was a small project then at that time, Al Hosh, and I thought that would be an ideal uh, venue for the project. So I curated a few exhibitions there and, uh, and uh, and these are some of the invitation cards, I guess. We don't have to show all of them. Then came 2009. At, during that time, I was also uh, uh, doing research on Palestinian artists. I traveled all over Palestine and uh, kept a journal on the artists I met and uh, which resulted in the Palestine Care of Venice exhibition at the Venice Vienna. That was the very first Palestinian representation uh, in Venice Biennale for that uh, show was also in 2009, along with this book that I, with my dear uh, colleague, uh, I co-edited with Nada Shabu. Fantastic. Uh, uh, this is a, a photo with Muna Hatoum that you said that you first uh, encountered in 1985. 
No, we first encounter. I well, I didn't talk to her then, but I saw I I re, I got introduced to her work through that performance. My family thought I was crazy to go to that neighborhood in England, in London. This is the invitation and some of the photo. This one by uh, of the Venice. I don't think we have time to go over that in more detail. There's quite a bit of about it in the on the internet. This is my dear friend Sheikh May. Al uh, Khalifa and uh, I, I in Bahrain. What a wonderful uh, country and what wonderful projects they're doing. I'm a great admirer of their heritage and art pro programs and institutions. Let's move forward. And these are the oh, I forgot you had these pictures. Right? <laughs> these are no, there's too many. Okay, that's yes. the my friend, and then I worked with the, the Syrian artist uh, Ilya Zayab on a book of uh, on on his uh, sort of like a retrospective. Yes. Um, okay. Professor, uh, this is uh, again some of the media coverage that you had in the newspapers. Um, I yeah, I think we don't need to dwell on this. Yes, these. yes, I actually. Uh, wanted to just show a little bit of your more recent work uh, the past uh, few years, uh, still continue to curate, still continue to publish. Um, but I think uh, I'm going to move on now to a, uh, I muted myself. Oh, the host muted me, they unmuted me. <laughs> so moving on. Uh, so this is maybe a question I'd like to ask you about Al Mawrid. If you could speak about Al Mawrid, the idea of Al Mawrid, because I feel like uh, the past one hour we have spoken about your, your trajectory, uh, supporting and exhibiting and curating and organizing Arab art since the 1960s. And here we are in 2020 uh, and Al Mawrid is, uh, is announced. What is Al Mawrid and why is Al Mawrid relevant to us? Why is it an important project? Well, uh, Al Mawrid should have been established not now, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, we are uh, living in precarious times when our archives and history are being lost almost on a daily basis across many Arab countries. And uh, we hear a great deal more recently about archive this, archive that, but what we wanted to do at this center was the proposal I initially wrote was, and which materialized now, is to combine research with an archive of primary and contemporary sources that will support scholarship and pedagogy at the same time and go beyond the established canon of art history that by investigating the histories of art of this region using primary and contemporary documents from this region. This is so important. Uh, the archive now will become an essential tool for not only for researchers from outside the university, but also for teaching art history in the university, for generating interdisciplinary courses in social science and art history, and contribute to a range of other uh, courses as well in other disciplines. Uh, it also will preserve these archives, which while we, uh, I, I have to say that it, uh, I, I am another, I, I'm very fortunate uh, that I have a platform such as NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, the university have offered me a number of opportunities to expand and consolidate my past experiences with uh, the knowledge I had accumulated over the years and that all I dedicate to my, in my teaching of the courses. So, and that helped me to start also the process for proposing uh, an MA in global art history. So altogether, the center did not spring by itself, but there was a series of discussions about it earlier through such programs as the MA in global art history, which such a center will contribute to clearly. And uh, for so very soon we will have a staff, I hope, of about eight persons. Uh, we will have uh, visiting scholars uh, who, but as I said, this is a center which will become one day, I hope, a nexus for uh, art professionals 
art historians from around the world to study art of the Arab world. And I'm hoping that art historians today who are uh, working on their, uh, either have done their dissertations on topic will, or have accumulated primary documents and, and te textbooks in Arabic, will donate those to the, our uh, archive and library. And this way we can digitize them. So the idea is to digitize, uh, digitize artists' archives, art institutions' archives, and, and books that are out of copyright print uh, that can be translated and uh, digitized online. So we're already starting with the translating uh, and digitizing uh, a few books now who that are in Arabic and we got permission for. It. So the, we are very excited about this and uh, I'm working with two co wonderful colleagues, uh, Professor Maida Ba, who is leading the social science and art history research and uh, Shamoun, Professor Shamoun Zamir, who is heading the uh, uh, and continues to work on the ACASA project, which is a photographic archive that he had started. And uh, I invited him to join the uh, Al Maurid, the Arab Center for the Study of Art, uh, adding in a wealth of material to the archive. Fantastic. Uh, Professor, we will be moving now to the last slide, but I just want to say a couple of things. Thank you to my colleague, Noor Tanmir, who put together this wonderful presentation. Uh, and also the poster that a lot of people messaged and asked, what is that image and who is that individual who appears in that uh, painting? And what is this relationship with this painting with our speaker today? Uh, poster was designed by my colleague, uh, Imran Ahmed Imran. And now we are revealing who the artist is. And I'd like you to tell us the circumstances of what led uh, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century, Ismail Shammur, to paint you in 1967 or so? Well, um, it started that he thought my face was very Palestinian and it would be great uh, to, you know, to start with a portrait and then incorporate it with the other series of work that he was working on. And I was going, and I was a frequent visitor to their to their home, and uh, benefited a great deal from their hospitality and the good food. Knowing what I couldn't afford to go to restaurants, and we didn't have any, you know, this was a great opportunity for many reasons. But it was wonderful to. Uh, that's when I was helping with the archive, which became a major archive later on, and so. Uh, that's how it all started and he painted it and one day my mother saw it at an exhibit I think it was his exhibit in Kuwait at Sultan Gallery my mother saw the painting and he said oh that's my daughter of course my my mother didn't know about my activities in Beirut and so oh, yes that's your daughter so my mother bought it and then gave it to me that's wonderful uh, so uh, I would like to thank Professor Selwa Maghdadi for uh, giving us time from her busy schedule and uh, wish her the best of luck. The majlis is officially over, but uh, what I usually do is I allow a few minutes. So if you'd like to hang around for a few minutes and uh, speak with uh, Professor Selwa, just to say hello, we're not, we're not posing questions. You can email her, reach out to her another time, but this is a chance for some of her old friends who don't usually connect on, um, on Zoom, just to say hello to her. Uh, if you'd like to say hello uh, to Professor Selwa, just raise your hand and I will unmute you and we can do this for a few minutes. We have Eli Dolan. Uh, go ahead, Eli. I see you carrying uh, the book. Could you, could, you, could you unmute yourself? Please, Eli, unmute yourself. Go ahead. I was at the Forces of Change in Washington, D.C. in 1994 with Selwa and her mother. It was a <laughs> wonderful experience. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. It's been a long time. It's good to see you. Thank and you. so I see Sophie Kazan here too. Sophie, would you like to say anything? Go ahead, Sophie. Unmute yourself. Yes, I, I'd like to say hello. And I'd like to also, um, she didn't speak about it, but at the Emirates Foundation, wow. uh, when Salwa first arrived in the UAE, these are the first courses in museum studies and curation in, in the UAE, I believe. So Salwa has to thank for a lot of that. Oh, thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Diana. Diana is here. 
Anyone else care to say anything? Just uh, go ahead, the Adela. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Sorry. Hi. Yes. I, I was actually going to mention that. I was actually going to mention the UAE, uh, the Emirates Foundation, because uh, two things that I wanted to mention, which I, was, uh, I always found important with Selwa's work, is her truly, truly Arab dimension. I mean, I mean we know that Selwa is uh, Palestinian, but she, her Arab dimension has been foremost, and she has always pushed artists from North Africa alongside artists from the, the Middle East, because usually, you know, Mid uh, Arab is a shorthand for Middle East and vice versa. And uh, um, Selwa has always been very aware of this. And I think people now in the UAE are aware of the excavation work that she did with uh, Bea. And the, and the second thing that I wanted to mention is uh, her service. Yani Selwa is somebody who is always doing service. And I remember how, when she used to come in Palestine in the 90s and all these um, the service she used to do, serving on juries and competition. And I remember in particular, and to close with this, Selwa, I was looking at you and I was like, my God, this woman is unbelievable. Doing a museum, uh, curating workshop at Birzeit University for Palestinian curators from inside. Zakari? Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Adela. We move on, we move on. Thank you, Adela. Anyone else uh, care to say anything to Selwa? Just briefly, just comments. Uh, I'm trying to see if any hands are up. Um, you can use a function or you can raise your hand and I will see you. Okay. Um, there you go, Manal. Go ahead, Manal. Sorry. Hi, Sultan. And assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Salwa. Um, sorry, I won't have my camera on, but I just wanted to thank you so much and uh, to um, go carry on with what uh, Dr. Adila just said. Um, Dr. Selwa helped us so much with the Baya exhibition that is now on at the Charge Art Museum. It's a wonderful exhibition where talking to her about her early times researching artists from everywhere in the Arab world, including North Africa, has been so amazing for us to find this information, to have documentation, interviews, things that are just so scarce. And I'm so proud of the new um, launch of this center. I know that it will be absolutely what has been needed for a long time, as Dr. Selwa said. And, you know, I just can't wait to be involved in any way we can to continue to um, disseminate all this information and knowledge to scholars and people around the world. So thank you, Dr. Selwa, for always being an inspiration for all of us, including in the museum's world, and pushing us to challenge ourselves and to promote Arab artists as much as possible in our institutions. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for coming too. And thank you, Sultan. Thank you. That was Manal Ataya, Director General of the Charger Museums Authority. I'll just take a couple of notes, uh, Professor Selwa, from the chat. We have Ali Dermaki, one of your students, saying, always an inspiration. I'm grateful and privileged to call her my professor of the art history program at Sorbonne Abu Dhabi. We have tons of people. Uh, Lynn Gumpert, greetings from NYU, New York City. We have thanks from uh, 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 from several individuals, um, uh, uh, Haifa, who I went to school with 25 years ago. Hello, Haifa. Um, Ali Al Mulla from Sharjah Museum, uh, Sharjah Art Museum. We have there was a lovely comment from they made a bar, beautiful stories and beautiful painting. Nadine uh, Nuruddin, what an inspiration! Thank you for this wonderful talk. There's so many. I mean, I can't read them all. Bana uh, Qattan, your colleague, best time of my life working at Selwa's researcher. Nada Shabut, we remember you by forces of change because you, capital U, are a force of change yourself. And so many other uh, beautiful comments. I mean, there's so many. And um, I think we call it to an end here, unless there's anyone else who wanted to say hello to Selwa. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Keep on inspiring us. We, are, we owe you a great deal. And uh, best of luck with the new uh, art center. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And happy Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 Shukran, ya. Shukran.